Welcome to Norlana Baptist Church. It's Sunday morning and I'm sure glad you were able to join me this morning for our time of worship. Let's begin our day by going to the Lord in prayer. I want to ask each of you to bow your heads, to close your eyes, no matter where you are, so that we can go to the Lord with these prayer concerns. We need to be praying about those who are sick with whatever that may be the coronavirus, flus, other anomalies in their life. Be praying about our churches, that as this virus crisis diminishes and they get back together, that they'll be able to work through those processes. Be praying about the world situation. We are in a world crisis, not just with this virus, but other crises of biblical proportions. Be praying for your family, for your health, for y'all to get along through these days and hours that you are confined to a home or a space. Be praying and ask God how you can help and minister to others during this time of isolation. Almighty Holy God, we come to you this morning and we lift up these prayer concerns, more of which we don't even know the needs are, but you do, Lord. You know them and you know them well. So Father, as we lift up this church and this message, I pray, Lord, that you'll use what your servant delivers today. I pray, Lord, you'll remove me from myself, really, and just use me, Lord. Give me the wisdom to be able to handle this very unusual delivery system, and, and but you can use it, Lord. We know that uh, you love us, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you know we love you too. In your Son's name we pray, amen. Baptist Church. My name is Lindsay Klingler, and I'm Pastor Doug and Janie Cutt's niece. I'm down here in Florida, and I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement this morning, a few things that's been on my heart the last couple of weeks. I want to start with this scripture. It says in Psalms 105, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. And God is so good, even through all this mess and even through this virus, we have to remember that we serve a good, good Father, and He is so good to us. The other one is a familiar scripture that we all know in uh, Psalms 23. It's the very last scripture, Psalms 23, 6. It says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. King James Version says, will follow me all the days of my life. His goodness will follow us. I also love Romans 8, 28, that says, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for the good. And so I just want to leave you with that encouragement this morning. And I hope you're blessed by this song.
As I mentioned in the prayer, there is a lot going on in the world today. A lot. Not only is this coronavirus affecting the entire world population, someplace worse than others. In the Middle East today, you, you need to be knowledgeable of, there's other military type crises. Countries that are making themselves known on a large scale, sending satellites in space and being threatening. But recently we have been made aware that there is another pandemic going on on a world level, and that's a hunger, a food supply. Friends, these are biblical warnings. Let me just lay that up for you. With that in mind, I want to carry you to your Bible in Acts, put your fingers on chapter 2, beginning in verse 40 through 47. That will be our scripture for today's lesson. I want to today to bring something to the forefront that's been on my mind and heart as this virus pandemic has been unfolding and we have been separated each other. If you go and you read the New Testament epistles, they shape the doctrine of the life of the church, but Acts traces the application of that doctrine in the history of the early church. And so what we're finding here in Acts chapter 2 is our fisherman, Peter, preaching. Preaching at Pentecost. Oh man, and he shut the corn. He brought it down. He told people what was really happening, what had happened, who Jesus Christ really was. And as a result of what he did, a result of what he said, as a result of him confronting these people with what they need to do and repent 
giving their heart, soul, and mind, body to God, that Christ is who He said He was. If you go to verse 41, you'll find out 3,000 souls got saved. Folks, we need more of that kind of preaching today all over the world. Beginning in verse 40, and I'm reading down from chapter 2 of the book of Acts, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Man, I can't imagine 3,000 people getting saved at one time. What a blessing it would be to see that happen across the country and the world. And in verse 42, And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continually with one in mind, with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was abiding, was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Today's message is called Regrowing the local church. And this passage that we just read describes and records the first meeting of that local church. The historical outworking of God's idea, the newborn church in its prime. And let me just stop right here to dispel the myths and rumors that propagate itself across the world. Man did not create the church. God did. It was his intent that the church would be, come about, had a purpose, had a vision, had a, a goal, a mission. And I pray you're part of that church today. This is the church of Jesus Christ. It's not belonged to any human being at all. With that in mind, this, this church that we got described here in the book of Acts is church at its best. This was a church, nothing more, nothing less. The church's life was defined by the devotion of those spiritual duties which made up the unique identity of God's church. Its life was defined by the living Lord, the Spirit, and the Word. In the early church, they had no cultural elements of success. They had no worldly strategies. They were endowed with every component for accomplishing the purposes of God. So today's message is a reminder. This is called Reminder Day. A day to remember the benefits of beginning, of being in the local church. And from this passage, I want to unfold for you today eight benefits, eight rewards if you want to call it, eight reasons for you to plug in and be part of the local church. And let me just remind you again, the, the, the local church is a viable part of what God had this thing all about. There are hundreds of thousands of local churches all over the world, and each one of them is unique, uniquely defined by the people that God brings to the church, uniquely defined by the ministries that they do based on the people that God brings to the church. Each one has a different place a different, in the big scheme of the body of Christ. But I got to tell you, this crisis as it unfolds, has divided the body all over the world, separated them, isolated them. And I understand the reason. But when we come back together, it's going to be different. The people are going to be different. I remember distinctly well when I was in Vietnam for almost 13 months. And in our mind, when our time was over, you get to come home and you look forward to getting back home. But when you got there, it wasn't the same. And you don't have to go to a war to experience that. Just stay away from home a few months. And when you come home, you, it won't be the same. Even the people. So as we come back together, and we will come back together, we will need to regrow the church. So the benefits of doing that out of this scripture. First of all, they were a body of believers. They were a body of believers. 
And as a body of believers, they each got a, a piece of the body. They each experience a defining moment that they could identify with God. Because as believers, each one of them had given their heart, soul, and mind, and body to God. They were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. There was a moment that they could put down on the calendar and say, I became a child of God on this day. And my life changed as a result. Each was filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit came into them, they became a child of God, a cog, if you will. And as that cog, as that child of God, they began new power of the Spirit that they could use, a new defense against the wiles of Satan and his demons. Thirdly, each brought a special gift to the church to use by God. Every person that gives their heart, soul, and mind to God, every person that becomes truly saved, God gives them at least one gift. And that gift has a purpose to be used in God's church. If you don't know your gift, well, if you're a member of this church, come talk to me. We'll figure it out. Some people, he gave more than one gift, but everyone has at least one. Not only were they body believers, but they received instruction. As the scripture says, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They received instruction. They were taught. God designed the church to be a place where His Word would be proclaimed and explained. Proclaimed and explained. Paul mandates this through the apostles, uh, the, epistles, the pastoral epistles, if he were. He described the ongoing process to Timothy when he wrote, These things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 God also designed the church to be a place where there was commitment to learn His Word. That there was a commitment to learn His Word. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, that in it and by it that you may grow in respect to salvation. In other words, we've got to quit being cold cereal and get on the T-bone steaks of the Word. We've got to get dwell into it so that we not only hear it, but it gets in our mind and our heart and it changes who we are and who we see. God also designed the church to be a place where there was a transformation through learning. To the Romans, Paul wrote in Romans 12, too, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Friends, if you had that defining moment with God, you should be different. If you're not, maybe you didn't have that defining moment. But only you know that with the Holy God. But the bottom line is this. If you became a believer, you got changed. And as you got changed, you should see life different. You should see the world different. You should see God's Word different. You should have this longing to be in the Word, to learn and grow, to become something different that's useful to God. If you're not, you need to back up and find out what the challenge is, why I didn't you or how you didn't. You need to call someone that can help you work through that process so that you can grow to be acceptable and perfect. Now, we're not perfect now. But we're supposed to be striving for perfection. It's called sanctification. And that happens in the local church. One of the reasons God created the local church. God designed the church to be a place where there was a priority of preaching the Word. A priority of preaching the Word. Paul wrote his letter, or excuse me, Peter wrote the letters, or Paul did, to Timothy and Titus. And three of the notes in them, 1 Timothy 4, 6, says, "...in pointing out these things to the brethren..." You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine with which you have been following. In 1 Timothy 4.13, he wrote, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. And in 2 Timothy 4.1 and 2, Paul wrote, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. 
Let me just pause right there because I have a note here about us today. Something for us that needs to be gleaned out of this. As believers, you and I should be counted a wasted day if we don't learn something new and more deeply enriching by the truth of God's Word. When we read the Word of God every day, when we absorb it, there ought to be something that just grabs us. I don't care how many times you have read the Bible. I mean, how many times you've read a particular book of the Bible. The next time you read it, if you let God, He'll enlighten you with something else about it. Secondly, as believers, Scripture is the food for our spiritual growth and power. How can we grow closer to God if we're not in God's Word? Because that's how we learn who He is. That's how we learn about Him. That's how we learn how He indwells us and uses us. Thirdly, churches that ignore the exposition and application of Scripture are doing so at their own peril. If you're not teaching the people how God's Word unfolds, how in the world are they going to apply it? How are they going to walk out of church with a message in their pocket that they can use in the day-to-day -day life? And fourthly, I would just say what Hosea did to Israel. He warned them in Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My friends, the early church was in the business of teaching and training. We need to be in it today. We need to make sure that it's not just lip service, but people actually learn and grow because of it. The third thing of the benefits is they had fellowship. They had fellowship, and it was called into fellowship. And fellowship is a spiritual duty of believers. It is designed to stimulate each other to holiness and faithfulness. We need each other. We need accountability, and that comes out of that fellowship. Fellowship is to receive Jesus Christ and become partners with Him as well as the other believers. 1 John 1, 3. Fellowship is also permanent because of our shared eternal life. Mark my words, friend. If you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you truly saved, it's permanent. Nobody can take it away. And because you are a believer, and because you have been saved... And you will also then have this fellowship. I had a young kid the other day said they couldn't tell the difference between this person and that person. He didn't know if they were sisters or not. I said, are they believers in Jesus Christ? He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, then they're sisters. You have family if you are a believer. Not only that, the fellowship's neglected causes the joy associated with it shared life to be lost. In other words, if you neglect the fellowship, you, you lose the joy that comes from a church family, from other believers and what's going on in their life. And number five, fellowship for Christians is to participate in the life of the local church and failing to do so, quite frankly, is inexcusable. Now I understand in the virus times things are different. But sooner or later, we're going to be in non-virus times and choosing then to be absent from assembling together is directly disobedient to a command of Scripture. Read it. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 charges the believers to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, but as a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The folks in these current times Close fellowship, I know, cannot be done. And those that complain about why no one has called them to check on them, well, I had a thought today. If you're calling and wonder why nobody's calling to check on you, that's probably God's way of telling you, you need one to be making the calls. And then you'll get in a conversation with your brothers and sisters. Number four of the benefits, they observe the ordinances. Friends, breaking of bread. Their fellowship was symbolized by obedience to the spiritual duty of breaking the bread, the Lord's Supper. And this duty is not optional. The Lord commanded it to be done by every believer, 1 Corinthians 11. Communion is believers meeting on a common ground at the foot of the cross. It's communion calls for a self-examination, if you will, a purging of sin. As a result, the church gets purified. The Bible's real clear on taking the Lord's Supper with an unpurified spirit, unconfessed sin, as it were. It says you must come clean to the table. Nothing is more vital to the church's ongoing, regular confrontation of sins in its members than the thoughtful expression 
of devotion to the remembrance of the cross. Folks, if you do the communion in a church other than this one, I beg of you, do it with seriousness. Don't make it a ritual. Make it have meaning to the people there. Make people come to it and as a, a church should with clean heart. Number five, if they had, if they had corporate and individual prayer. In, in the scripture we read, it talks about to pray. The first fellowship was eagerly and persistently engaged in the critical duty of prayer. Why? Because my friends, prayer causes things to happen. Prayer causes things to happen. Honest, fervent prayer will change the person that's doing the praying. <laughs> it will also be in obedience to God. It'll also open the person praying to hear and understand the things of God. The early church took that promise as a source of God's provision in praying that all their needs relentlessly pursuing the divine help. They pursued it because they knew in their hearts that God said, ask and it shall be given. And I'd also tell you this, that prayer is not just an individual's believers, but is a corporate thing with the church. Sadly as it is, today, prayer is neglected. It's neglected in the church, substituted by programs, concerts, entertainment, one of the testimonies of the rich and famous, that's what draws the crowds. Not so much gathering gets called for serious prayer time. But I can tell you this, mark it down. Perhaps the lack of serious, fervent prayer is the reason for so much weaknesses in the contemporary church today. If we're not on our knees, broken before a holy God, submitting our soul to Him, submitting our heart and mind to Him, submitting our time to Him, being repentive, of our sins to Him, we won't get the strength. Have we forgotten the Bible's command to pray at all times for all things, little and big? Have we forgotten the Bible's command to be devoted to prayer? The sixth benefit of the local church. They had an effective outreach. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And I love that term in verse 43. Awe refers to a fear or a holy terror related to the sense of divine presence, to the attitude of reverence. It's a good fear. It's not a scaredy fear. It's a reverential fear. All describes the feeling produced when you realize God is at hand. The life of this first fellowship was so genuine and spiritually powerful that everyone, whether inside or outside the church, kept have this feeling of sense of awe. They weren't all by the church's buildings, the programs, or anything human ability, but by the supernatural character of the church's life. Wonders and signs were designed to attract attention and point to spiritual truth. The Lord was adding to their number. They also had a common cause, had all things in common. They possessed a spiritual unity and a practical oneness. Having all things in common does not indicate communal living. My friends, God's social unit, the basic social unit is the family. Sharing and mutual meeting of the, of the needs of the pilgrims was a longstanding tradition in Israel. It was a longstanding tradition, especially around great religious feasts. The inns could not accommodate all this influx of people that were coming in to the feast pr procession. As a result, the common people opened their homes. Many of the early church were just such pilgrims. They came for Pentecost. They came for the celebration. They found the church. They found Jesus Christ. They joined and never left. Next, they had mutual assistance. They were sharing with them all as anyone had need. Now, this is not early communism. They did not sell everything and pool all the money and all the resources into a common pot. What they did was in order, if they had done that, they would have obliterated, as it were, the responsibility of each visitor, each believer, to give a return to God in response to the Spirit's prompting. But it is clear in verse 46 that an individual still owned homes. What happened was that the personal property was sold as anyone might have a need, and then those people were provided. It's an indication then and today of immense generosity. People gave not only their 
present cash or goods, but also they were giving away their future in a sacrificial love to meet those in need. My friends, that's your eight benefits. But these eight benefits are all positive benefits. There's no negatives. When 3,000 people who confessed faith in Christ that day were baptized in verse 41, and those that showed the genuineness of their faith by continuing to, despite of the hate and the ridicule of the surrounding community they were in, and the other Jewish people, the persecution they suffered from the Romans, they remained faithful. And my friends, that's a mark of genuine salvation. Jesus said in John 8, 31, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. To fully understand and participate in those benefits, you need to come and hear. And I know right now you're at the hearing stage. You can't do the coming stage. But we're getting preparation for that. We're, as, a, as a body of Christ, wherever we are, we need to be getting our minds set on the fact that at some point in time in the not too distant future, we're going to be gathering as the body again. And once the local church opens again, visitors, even those that do not yet believe, they're going to be welcome. They're going to be welcome to come and hear the gospel preached. They're going to come and hear the word of God expounded on. They are welcome to come and hear the prayers of confession, the anthems of praise, people singing, the calls to holiness. They're going to be welcome to witness the corporate love and devotion of the church to Jesus Christ and the eternal God and each other. You will never know what God will do until you let Him do it, my friends. God does not force Himself on you or anyone. So what would the church look like after this crisis? Quite frankly, I don't have a clue. I don't know what we'll do as the body of Christ. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But I tell you what, I can't wait to find out. Because I know from God's Word that we will still need to come together and we'll need to grow as this church in, in Acts chapter 2 has laid out for us this idyllic situation that unfolded with these new believers, even in crises and sacrifices. Let's pray, friends. Almighty Holy God, even today as we're delivering this message and the demons of electronics have interfered and we've had to re-record, you know much better than I about these things, Lord. It must mean that Satan didn't want somebody to hear this message right where they are. Father, I pray that you push through that in a way that will soften people's hearts, will cause them to see that you are truly God, the Creator God, and it is your church. And Father, on the other side of this pandemic, on the other side of this unique crisis that we're facing right now, a crisis where nobody in church leadership, not even in our government, had a clue what to do, and we're just working our way through it. And Father, you will bless us that you will allow us to come back together as a church, growing strong, reaching out to the lost, reaching out to the needy. Oh, Father, we're counting on your blessings in this regard. We love you, Lord. May all we do in this process as it unfolds, may all we say as we reach out and evangelize, may all that we go and where we go and even these electronic messages, if it is your desire that they be continued, Lord, that we do it to bring you glory. Our mission here is to win the lost and raise the saints so they can go out and win more lost. We lift up this prayer in the most powerful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.